Hi, this is Tom Lusher with Inside Cardiology, now with a center stage topic, long COVID. After everybody now lives normally again, after uh, two years of a difficult uh, period, we believe everything's over, but it's not over. After COVID is long COVID. And uh, the question is, how common is it? And uh, here you see a paper that just uh, appeared in the European Heart Journal that really summarizes this uh, very nicely. So let's uh, go through, uh, through the different steps. First of all, uh, Anthony Fauci, he created this word PASC, post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2, is very complicated. And in fact, the patient just called it long COVID because that's how he felt it was. Now, the National Institute uh, for Clinical Excellence uh, did it a bit more complicated. Uh, it says in, uh, there's an inoculation, is an infection. Then, of course, there is the acute uh, infection, let's say four weeks uh, as they defined it. Then uh, there is an ongoing symptomatic COVID phase, four to 12 weeks, which is actually peculiar for this infection, much less so for, for influenza or other uh, infections. But in principle, many infections do have uh, some ongoing symptomatic periods. But what's very typical uh, for COVID, of course, is then the chronic phase that is beyond three months or 12 weeks. Now this all together then leads uh, to a recovery phase. But what we put together here is long COVID as a patient co coined it, and that's what it is today. And uh, eventually, hopefully, this leads to recovery. Now this is the summary uh, of the whole uh, course of the disease. Uh, first of all, uh, particularly in cardiovascular, we have a COVID-19 associated myocardial injury, acute and chronic uh, uh, pathophysiological mechanisms that involves, as you see, the viral toxicity, an inflammatory response by the body against the virus that often is overshooting and uh, causes a lot of diseases, thrombosis, vasculitis, and an autoimmune response may also follow, and we'll come back to that. Then we have the cardiovascular sequelae that can range from myocardial infarction, right ventricular injury due to pulmonary affections, viral myocarditis, not so common though, uh, inflammatory myocarditis neither uh, as well, and then there is an autoimmune myocarditis possibility, and there's POTS, we'll come back to what this uh, abbreviation means. Then we have long-term cardiovascular sequelae. After that, this, there is hospitalization for heart failure, for infarction, for stroke, for uh, 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 emotional uh, disorders, uh, atrial fibrillation, ventricular tachycardias, and so forth. And eventually we have long COVID symptom trajectory and impact, and this can be going up and down uh, with uh, persisting comorbidities, uh, um, uh, uh, symptoms in the context of comorbidities and of course then mental uh, health issues and uh, dysfunction, social and professional dysfunction, really bad uh, consequences. Now the question is how important is it, how, what is the prevalence of long COVID and here you see what has been published, anything you can choose is available uh, from 1 to 70 percent and you can see in different countries uh, there's a huge difference and the question is why? Well, here you see the uh, confounders that uh, may uh, be involved in this uh, enormous variability of the reported prevalence. And you can see it's the source of enrollment. Is it communities in the hospital? Is it in a, a specialized clinic? Uh, the age and sex may play a role. Uh, in principle, elderly and males are more affected uh, than uh, younger females, timing of assessment, uh, then socio-democratic uh, factors, the vaccine, are you vaccinated or not, how often, then pre-existing health disorders, clearly also mental health disorders are a risk factor for persistence, the sample size, is it a couple hundred patients or thousands, uh, and the variability in the methodology used, is it an app, is it a, a a clinic where patients are assessed and so forth. Uh, 
Overall, we can say when uh, we look at the overall well-being of patients, there is the physical functioning is re uh, reduced. You can see COVID in blue and controls in, in red by this paper by uh, Betty Rahman. The role of physical, uh, role of emotional energy, emotional well-being is all a bit reduced. Social functioning is clearly reduced and so forth. So people are not doing uh, well after that, that's for sure. Now, what symptoms do we have? Uh, these are the long COVID symptoms and signs. You can see cardiovascular, we will dwell on this in more detail. Of course, we have chest pain, palpitations, breathlessness, uh, then uh, neurocognitive uh, manifestation, uh, brain fog, uh, headache, migraine, all kinds of things like that, the respiratory manifestation, particularly dyspnea, breathlessness, lack of uh, exercise tolerance, and then also in the muscle, the fatigue, chronic fatigue syndrome is very close to what we see here. The kidneys, the GI system and gastrointestinal system, the liver are affected. So it's really quite a broad spectrum of symptoms. Interestingly, in terms of cardiovascular functioning of the lung muscles and the heart, you can see that uh, the maximal oxygen uptake is uh, reduced in those uh, that had COVID in general. So that's what we see in many patients that after the infection, they are not doing well when they go up the stairs or want to uh, take up again uh, jogging or biking or what have you. And if you look at the lungs that have been reported in patients with severe COVID, you are not surprised that uh, this is not well functioning uh, also during exercise. It may improve over time, but there may be also some persistent changes in lung function and structure. Now, the long-term cardiovascular outcomes uh, in this paper in Nature Medicine has been reported in really thousands of patients. Uh, the biggest uh, so far, uh, it's uh, the risk of 12 months burdens and of incident post-acute uh, COVID-19 cardiovascular outcomes compared with a comparatory uh, control cohort that's really huge. And here you can see, uh, first of all, the hazard ratio and then the actual excess uh, per uh, thousand patients on the right-hand side. And here you can see that the cerebrovascular disorders are more common, stroke, TIAs, atrial fibrillation, particularly some other dysrhythmias, inflammatory heart disease, uh, myocarditis, huge hazard ratio, but actually the prevalence per thousand uh, uh, patients is not very big, as you can see on the right. And then we have in heart uh, ischemic heart disease, other cardiac uh, disorders such as heart failure and uh, in particular, and thrombotic disorders. Uh, like pulmonary embolism uh, that are known also during the acute phase, but also thereafter. And then uh, there is something very special, that's the long hold post-COVID-19 symptoms presenting as a variant of post postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Uh, this is uh, something that you see here. On top, you have the blood pressure on down below the heart rate. So when uh, these uh, subjects are laying down, they already have 100 uh, beats per minute, usually also at night, possibly because uh, of uh, uh, an involvement of the vagus nerve that no longer blocks heart rate uh, during rest. But then if they stand up, the overshoot of the sympathetic nervous system leads to real tachycardia. In this particular patient, 150 beats per minute, not very dangerous, but very annoying and uh, whether uh, we should give a beta blocker or if a bradin in these patients is up for discussion. So what is uh, then also the cognitive defects uh, uh, present in these patients? And there are uh, cognitive disorders, particularly memory loss, sleep disorders. And you can see it depends really on this, uh, the presentation of the patients. If they had symptoms, uh, uh, but without respiratory symptoms, uh, if they had uh, respiratory symptoms and no uh, uh, assistance at home, respiratory symptoms, medical assistance at home, or even uh, on a ventilator, the, the worse, of course, the course acutely, the more there are cognitive disorders such as memory loss and others. 
And what are the possible mechanisms of long COVID? The short answer is we don't know, and that's also why we don't know how to treat it at this point. So research is really needed here. There are three options, chronic inflammatory response evoked by persistent viral uh, reservoirs in the heart following the acute infection, also in the nose, it has been noted. Uh, autoimmune responses uh, to cardiac antigens through molecular mimicry. We know this from uh, myocarditis in other contexts or persistence uh, endothelial dysfunction. So this is open for uh, research and I hope that some of the listeners will be motivated to go ahead to find out what is the problem and how can we help these patients that suffer for weeks, months, maybe longer. So thank you very much for listening.